at every time, or at many times at least, in our lives, we have wondered, and I'm sure every Christian has wondered, why children of God, believers, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, at times suffer, have afflictions, difficulties, sorrows, griefs, and all the countless problems that can afflict us. This question has always troubled God's people. I'm sure that we can, those of us who have studied the book of Job, have seen in that book this question over and over again. Why is this righteous man, Job, suffering as he is? I believe that this question and this problem finds its fullest answer in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, which part of which we read this morning as our scripture lesson. This letter, written to Jewish believers, Hebrew believers, during the first century, people who were of Jewish background but who believed in Jesus as the Messiah, were suffering. Many of these people were being persecuted not only by the Gentiles, but in fact by their fellow Jews that did not accept Jesus. Some of them, no doubt, were rejected by their families because they had accepted Jesus as their Lord. And their families refused to accept this or to go along with it. And so they felt rejected of their dearest loved ones. Some of them had suffered the taking away of their possessions by the authorities. We read about that in church history, how that not only were people uh, killed, but before that even happened many times, all their possessions were taken away by the rulers to punish them for their Christian faith. These particular believers, the writer says, had not yet resisted to the point of shedding their blood. They hadn't obviously been killed yet, but they had suffered. They had been afflicted from one angle or another, or from one way or in one way or another. And of course, the question always comes, why is this happening to me? I'm sure all of us have asked ourselves that question at one time or another. Why is it happening to me? Why do we go through these things? And we all do, at one time or another. In verses 6 and 7, <clears throat> we read, I think, the basic key to it all. And the rest is basically commentary on the key. Verse 6 says, Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. The King James uses the word chastening. Chastening. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. The word discipline is a more current word the original word is an interesting one that is found in our Greek text. It literally means child training. Child training. Whom God loves, he child trains, is literally what it says. He child trains. All of us who are parents uh, know what it is to train children, or at least to try to raise them up in a way that will be uh, an honor to themselves, an honor to their family, and a fruitful member of society, as well as, hopefully, a follower of the Lord. We all know what that is. And children themselves know what it is to have that training. At least they do if their parents take their responsibilities seriously. Sadly, there are many children today whose parents seem to have abdicated that responsibility. We are told by sociologists, for example, that there are so many children in our society who have very little parental guidance 
if any, and sometimes what they do have is very bad, very harmful to them, the example that they're given by their parents. But we have a parent in heaven, Heavenly Father, who can never make a mistake in the way that he trains his children. We as parents, no doubt, have made many mistakes. If we're honest with ourselves, there are times when we did not deal wisely or patiently with our children. And we look back and we think, yeah, that was wrong. That was a mistake. But God doesn't make those kinds of mistakes, even though we may think at times that he does. We may think that because this is happening to me, whatever it is, God is making a mistake. But he isn't. He really isn't. And we'd like to see why he isn't and all the implications of that. I'd like to turn to Second Chronicles, the 12th chapter. Perhaps this is a rather obscure incident from Israel's history, but I think it serves to illustrate a point here. You remember that Solomon had a son named Rehoboam. This son lost the northern part of his kingdom because of foolishness, but he still was, at least in name, serving God. And he was sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Rehoboam felt, well, everything's all set now. I'm king. Everything's in my hands. I don't have to follow the Lord anymore. Because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. Pharaoh and his army came up against Jerusalem. With 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of Libyans, Sukkites, Cushites, that came with him from Egypt, he captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Egypt had chariots. Those were the tanks of their day. Egypt had all the latest weapons. They had many soldiers, not only their own people, but we read of other three other nations and armies that came with them. So they captured the Jewish fortified cities. They got as far as Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak. And he said to them, This is what the Lord says. You have abandoned me. Therefore I now abandon you to Shishak. You people have forgotten me. You've decided to go your own way. Okay. We'll let Shishak deal with you. Let's see how you like that. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is just. Please examine in your mind that statement. These people could have begun to make all manner of excuses for themselves. You know, they could have said, Well, the Lord isn't fair. Why should he turn us over to this terrible army that can annihilate us and destroy our nation completely just isn't fair why are we subjected to this terrible danger this threat but no we read these people had the wit the sense to realize that God was just he was fair the Lord is just when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. 
They will, however, become subject to him so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands. And so we read that Shishak did attack Jerusalem and he carried off some of the treasures of the temple. He didn't destroy the city. He didn't put the people under complete subjection, but he did take enough away from them that they realized that he'd been there and that they needed to learn a lesson from this. They needed to learn a lesson from it. This child training is a very interesting process. One of the places in which that word is used is in 1 Corinthians 11. It's used in conjunction with the Lord's Supper. And of course, in that supper, we read that Paul tells the believers that they should examine themselves to see whether they are observing that supper properly, because some were not doing so. Some were simply using it as a place to eat and drink rather than a place to remember the Lord until he comes. And so he says, which may seem rather strange, but verse 30, he says, that is why, and he's talking about not recognizing the body and blood of the Lord when we eat and drink, he says, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Some have died in the church. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, chastened, child trained, that's the word there, so that we will not be condemned with the world. The reason Paul gives here for chastening, for discipline, even to the point of death in some cases, is that his children may not be condemned with the world. They are his children. They may be disobedient. They may be chastened. They may suffer some real tough times. But the reason, he says, is that they will not be condemned with the world. There's a difference between God's chastening of his children and his punishing of those who do not know him or recognize him, or serve him. There is a difference, and a very crucial difference at that. And so, when we go back to the book of Hebrews, we see that the writer distinguishes between those who are true sons, in verse 8, and those whom he says are illegitimate children. Illegitimate children here would have to be those who profess to be believers but are not really in their heart. There have always been such. One of the first great influxes of such happened in the time of Constantine. You may remember from your history that Constantine was the first Roman emperor to say that Christianity was all right in the early 300s. And then he went further and made Christianity the state religion. Well, when that happened, can you imagine all the people that suddenly said, we're Christians? You know, because the emperor claimed to be a Christian and the government claimed to be Christian and it was popular to be a Christian. All of a sudden, thousands and thousands of people got baptized because there, was, there were privileges to be enjoyed if you could say you were a Christian. And so the apostle here writes about those who are illegitimate children and not true sons. But the true sons and daughters will be child trained of their heavenly father. They will be. 
as we look at this, we recognize that chastening is not always pleasant. Obviously it isn't. In fact, it usually isn't. When we look back, for example, to our childhood, and some of you who are children here today, know that at times mom and dad have said this or that, or you can't do this or that, or go to your room, or whatever it is. Maybe they've even used a little uh, corporal punishment at times. And it wasn't pleasant. Nobody liked it. They didn't like do dishing it out, and we didn't like getting it, did we? And yet, when we look back at that, if we're honest now, if we're honest, we know that it was usually, usually, maybe not always, but usually, it was good. It w in the long run, it was good for us because we appreciate what we learned later, maybe not at the time, and the writer says that here in Hebrews, in verse 11, he says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. He doesn't say for everyone. Sometimes people have different reactions to God's chastening. Reactions that do not achieve the maximum benefit from that chastening. Because they do not, re, uh, uh, they're not willing, they refuse to be trained by that situation, whatever it happened to be. And therefore they don't get the maximum benefit of it. Let's look at what he says to these people about it. First of all, in verse 5, he says, You've forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. King James says, Despise not the chastening of the Lord. Don't look down on it. Don't make light of it. Don't think ill of it, he's saying as though it is of little value. It is of great value if accepted properly. But even more, notice in verse 15, he says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. One of the problems that all of us have at times when we suffer is that we are tempted to feel bitter. That's human. We've all gone through that, I'm sure, or will sometime or other. We say, why is this happening to me? And we feel bitter. We feel frustrated. And that bitterness not only is directed against God, though maybe covertly so, but it reaches out to those about us. It affects others as well. Because rather than receiving this in a way that will help us, we resist and we feel bitter about it. That's why we're warned here not to allow any bitterness to grow up, to cause trouble, and to defile many, he says. Not only ourselves, but bitterness is like a crop that grows and grows and reaches out and the seeds scatter far and wide and affect many other people. So he warns us against bitterness, which is so natural at this, in these kinds of times. He also says not to lose heart. Not to lose heart. Or the King James says, faint not. Don't faint. Don't grow weak over this. Sometimes we say, well, how can I stand it? I can't stand any more of this. This is awful. The Apostle Paul got to that place too one time. He tells about it in 2 Corinthians 12. He was having some real tough times. In verse 7 of that chapter, he says, To keep me from becoming conceited, 
because of these surpassingly great revelations, Paul had lots of wonderful revelations from God. He had some things that happened from God's hand that were truly miraculous. You know, he had personal dealings with God. He heard his voice. He heard Jesus' voice talking to him different times. He sent, was sent visions and so on. And he had miracles happening all the time through his own hands and all around him. And he says God wanted to keep him from becoming conceited because of all of this. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Torment isn't very pleasant, is it? Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is in your weakness, in our weakness. Therefore, here's Paul's reply then. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. He had learned his lesson. Now, what that thorn in the flesh was, scholars have debated on that for centuries. We'll never know until the Lord comes, probably. But I'm glad we don't know. Because it covers any conceivable thorn in the flesh that we could have. And Paul says that the Lord was trying to teach him from that, that the real strength was not in himself, but in the Lord. And only by learning to trust and rely on the Lord would he find strength to bear it all, to go through it, and to say, not to say anymore, why is this happening to me? <clears throat> but let's go on. Looking at Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in the 10th chapter, the 13th verse, he writes to these people, no temptation or trial, the word temptation means trial or testing, has seized you except what is common to man. Lest you think that you are an exceptional case, nothing like this has ever happened to anybody else, Paul is saying, taint so. It's common to man. This has happened probably to countless others before you and around you this is happening or has happened. So it's not unique to you, is what he's saying here. So nothing, he says, has seized you. I like the word seized there. King James says taken. But seized is even better. Because when we get these trials and, and difficulties, it's like they grabbed hold of us. They seized us. We're in their grip. We can't get away. But he says, what well, except what is common to man. But here's the beautiful thing. God is faithful. He will not let you, and he's talking to believers here now, he will not let you be tempted or tried beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. He will provide a way. The problem is we often don't look for that way, it seems to me. We're so occupied with our problem, whatever it happens to be, our illness or our marital problems, our family difficulties, financial problems, whatever, that we fail to examine what may be, in that case, the way out. What way has God provided for us? out of that problem and that trial and that testing. We're told here that he will do so. He is faithful. He is not going to abandon us, even though we think he has. He hasn't. And he will, he says, not 
try us or test us above what we can stand. He knows what we can stand. Some people can stand more than others. But he knows in each case what it is that we can stand. There's a scripture that I've always loved, just a short one. It says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. There's a time for excitement. It's a time for vocal praise. There's a time for quiet meditation and praise as well and thankfulness. Here he says, be still and know that I am God because in these times when we're going through such things, a little quiet introspection with God, meditation better than introspection perhaps, and reading his word and seeking his face will do far more for us than running around and feverishly looking for answers here and there that are not found or based upon his word. And so often this is our problem. We do that instead of seeking him as we should. Going back to the book of Hebrews <clears throat> in the 12th chapter and the 9th verse, he says, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Submit is the key. Submit. Submit means that you surrender. You no longer are putting up an argument to God. You're saying, all right, Lord. Remember one thing that Job said? Out of all his boils and all his pain, this is to me one of the key verses. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, though God kills me, I'm going to trust him no matter what. Boy, that's faith. That is faith. That is submission. That is surrender to God. And sometimes it's hard for us to come to that place, isn't it? We really have a hard time with that, every one of us. Coming to that place where we say, all right, Lord, it's all in your hands. Whatever, though you slay me, I'll trust you. It's for the best. You know best. The old saying, you know, Father knows best. But Father really does know best when we talk about the Heavenly Father. Sometimes earthly Father doesn't know best, unfortunately. I know that. But it is true that this Father knows best. He knows best. The fifth chapter of Hebrews and the eighth verse, we read of Jesus. Our great example, isn't he the greatest example we have? Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Boy, there's a lot in that passage. Jesus was the Son of God. You might say, well, he had it easy. He did? Boy, if you say that, you haven't studied the Gospels very much. Though he was a son, he learned obedience by what he suffered. And it wasn't only the suffering on the cross. And that was the worst. That was the culmination, of course, of his physical sufferings. But think of the times that he suffered rejection by those he loved. Think of the time when he stood over Jerusalem. He was on a hill looking over down at Jerusalem. Yesterday, Jay and I were over near Waterville up on Badger Mountain looking down on Waterville from up on the mountain. Jesus was up high looking out on the city of Jerusalem. And it says he cried, he wept, 
over Jerusalem. He loved Jerusalem. He loved the people. They were God's nation of Israel. He says, how many times I've wanted to gather you to me as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you would not. You wouldn't have it. You rejected me. And in rejecting him, of course, they were rejecting the Heavenly Father as well. He learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. The other day I had a letter from a lady who was talking about Adam and Eve in their time of perfection. Of course, she was referring to the time before their disobedience. And I wrote back and I said to this sister, remember that Adam and Eve were not in perfection. They were in innocence. They had not yet sinned. But they had not reached perfection. Perfection requires testing, trial, training. Jesus, we are told, became perfect from what he suffered. He learned that obedience and once being made perfect, it says. He wasn't perfect in the sense that he had reached it all, successfully attained it all, even though he never sinned. I'm not saying that he sinned. He was innocent of sin. But perfection came when he completed the job and said, it is finished, and died on the cross for you and me. That was the end of it all, as far as his mortal attainment. After that, of course, was the resurrection. And he was then a perfect, immortal human being. The Son of God. Perfect. A man. A perfect man. But what did it go through? What did he have to go through to get that? And we see what it is. We have just a cut. one other thing I'd like to notice about this <clears throat> thing that the writer tells us here in Hebrews. Probably the hardest thing of all. He speaks about rejoicing. Rejoicing. Uh, yet this. Because it is a sign that you are God's sons. Rejoice. Rejoice at your trials. First Peter, the fourth chapter in the twelfth and thirteenth verses. Let's look at that a moment. First Peter 4, 12 and 13. He says, <clears throat> Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be, be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. What? Rejoice when we're going through those times? That's what Peter seems to be saying, doesn't he? Rejoice. I wonder if that rejoicing wouldn't help us to bear the pain better, to rejoice. He says to rejoice. Now, obviously, this is not done in our own strength. We can't. Our, our human nature and our old flesh, as we say, the old carnal nature, wants to complain, wants to curse, wants to swear, wants to do anything else but submit and even especially to rejoice. Obviously, that's the way we are as human beings. And so if we're going to rejoice, if we're going to submit, it has to come through the power of God's Spirit in us, working in us. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Long-suffering is patience, isn't it? Patience under trial. Do we have the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit. We do, or we can, if the Spirit of God dwells in us, as it does in every true child of God. But sometimes we don't submit. We don't allow the Spirit to work in our lives. 
That's our problem, isn't it? I'd like to just re remind us, uh, remind all of us, and myself included, this is for me as well as you, that at, no at, at the time we get all this, these problems, it's not pleasant. No one ever said it was. He said it's painful. But later on, maybe, not, maybe it won't even be in this life. But it often is, though, thankfully. Later on, it yields, as he says, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised, King James says, or trained, the NIV says, by it. We all talk about exercise. Exercise is a very important thing in modern American society. We have places, gyms, gymnasiums, and so on springing up everywhere, and a lot of people are taking daily exercise, which is a good thing. But this is the kind of exercise that we must have if we're going to have godliness in our lives, holiness, and if we're going to be conformed to the image of God's Son. That's what he's looking for in us, that we should be made like Christ. Amen.